Hello, everybody. Good evening. And um, you probably just saw a little notice that uh, I'm going to go ahead and start recording this so that uh, if others who weren't able to make it tonight want to be able to view this, we're going to try to get it right up um, in the next day or so so that everybody can uh, view it at least on their own time. Uh, I am Brian Bros. I'm the executive director of Michigan TU. I recognize uh, most of the participant names on the list, and it is good to have you all with us this evening. I um, appreciate the time that you're giving us. <clears throat> we would like to, to tonight to roll out um, uh, more information about the, the TU Shared Priority Waters Program and how we are proposing to uh, select waters um, for inclusion in it inside of Michigan. And I'm going to be joined um, by many of the people who worked on this uh, for Michigan. And uh, I will introduce the, everybody a little bit later, a little bit later in the program. Um, but I think we will start out with Nicole DeMole. Uh, who is a staff person for TU National, uh, who is going to begin by sharing with you just some background information about the Shared Priority Waters program. And uh, when she finishes that, we will, uh, I, I will roll into a series of slides to explain the process that we went through and to tell you where, we're, where we are proposing. Uh, when I get through that, We'll invite some added comments. Um, if any of the other work group members have any, um, have anything that they'd like to add about the process. And then we'll do a, a Q&A uh, after that. So um, without further ado, Nicole, take it away. Thanks, Brian. Um, can you see the presentation okay? Perfect. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Nicole DeMal, and I work for Trout Unlimited as the Great Lakes Habitat Program Manager. And as Brian said, um, I'm going to kind of give a background about the shared priority waters process, and then Brian will get into more details. So go ahead. So we know that to you as an organization, we do um, a lot of great things and we have a, a huge imprint on um, the country with cold water resources. Um, or our organization has quadrupled in size over the past decade. And we put in about $75 million per year for protection, reconnection and restoration efforts um, into those important um, rivers and streams. But even with all that work, um, there's still more work to do. And with climate change, we know that that is a huge threat that's um, impacting our cold water river systems. But being TU, uh, we remain hopeful. We work at both the local on the ground and national levels with our work. Um, but we know that we can do um, a lot more if we work together and we expand our efforts. So with this in mind, Trout Unlimited has developed a, a strategic plan um, in 2021. It's a five-year strategic plan. And I just wanted to read the vision and mission here. Um, our vision is for communities across America to engage and the work of repairing and renewing our river streams and other water bodies in which we all depend. And our mission is to bring together diverse interests to care for and recover rivers and streams so that our children can experience the joy of wild and native trout and salmon. And so to dive a little bit deeper into that, I'm just gonna um, mention the three goals that were identified to fulfill this mission. Um, the first is to develop a blueprint um, for where we're actually going to take strategic action um, for on the ground restoration and recovery of those systems. We want a call to action to inspire diverse volunteers, partners, and staff um, to work in these lands and waters. 
And then also to invest in systems and people. So this is really um, thinking about the resources and the tools that we need to get those jobs done. So for the purposes of the presentation tonight, we're really focusing kind of on that goal one. And that process um, is the shared priority waters. So an outcome of this goal is that we have this blueprint of priority waters that is shared um, for to you, both at the national council and chapter levels for our partners and constituents. And that our TU staff, volunteers, partners are inspired and actively engaged um, with these priority waters and the shared agendas within them. And then key strategies um, is to develop priority waters criteria um, with councils, chapters, and partners. And Brian's gonna talk about that a little bit later in the presentation about how that was done. And to align those TU resources and investments and those tools behind those shared conservation goals and metrics. And so here's um, kind of a timeline of those phases for this priority waters process in developing this blueprint. So last year, um, May through October, it was kind of the information gathering stage where we communicated with TU staff and other um, grassroots and partners to get the available data about our cold water systems in the state of Michigan. And from there, there was this kind of phase two, which is broken up into two parts. So the first one was developing these work groups, again, with national council and chapter leaders to um, review this ecological information and then also think about other metrics such as partnerships and the resonance within those watersheds. And we're kind of in the phase two uh, B right now, which is where we have these um, shared priority waters identified and we're going out to present um, this list to chapters and partners and, and the public just to get feedback about those priority waters that were selected and the process that we went through to get to those. And kind of the, the future, looking into the future for phase three, so this is talking about this fall, we want to develop a vision strategy and communication tools for the priority waters. And so this is going on across the nation. Um, and so there, there will be a specific implementation strategy for our Michigan shared priority waters. So this just kind of um, shows you all the information that went into this. So first for the information gathering, we took um, tools um, and data from the Great Lakes portfolio. We looked at distribution and status, status of um, uh, fish populations, climate resiliency, and other factors, and then kind of layering that with some additional factors. What do we know about the local watersheds? Is What kind of partner interest is in these um, areas? Is there conservation opportunity? And can TU really add value um, over the next five years in helping this watershed? And that all leads to um, kind of filtering out these shared priority waters lists, and again, that will lead to a robust conservation strategy that we can follow over the next five years. So um, I know Brian put this together. Did you want to introduce everybody with the slide, Brian? Sure, yeah, okay. I will. Um, so we knew that it was going to be a, a fairly daunting task to try to limit um, <laughs> and choose a, a handful of uh, waters to have a shared priority waters in the state of Michigan. Uh, we're obviously blessed with um, probably more than our state's uh, fair share of, of really incredible cold water fisheries. And it seemed a daunting task. So we formed uh, a working committee and we had uh, Tom Munt, the chair, um, Rob Smith, uh, our treasurer and past NLC uh, rep, Greg Walls, our past chair and uh, NLC rep, myself and Kristen Thomas, who are both staff people for uh, Michigan Trout Unlimited. And then we had Nicole DeMole, Jake Lemon, and Jeremy Geist, who are all TU National uh, staffers doing stream restoration work in Michigan. And uh, we formed right around the end of 2021. 
Um, I'd say we probably had at least eight group meetings over about a six month uh, time period. And we had quite a bit of work in between those meetings. Obviously the meetings were to generate ideas and hey, we need this, we need to look at that. And then we'd have to do some work in between to get those together, have time to look at it and be ready to discuss them. Um, <clears throat> and right from the get go, um, we wanted to try to identify and use um, relevant and objective or quantitative metrics as much as we could first to help us in the prioritization and selection process. Um, we also, a little bit later on in the process, tried to consider some more of the subjective or quali qualitative factors, um, the, the ability to add value, um, the likelihood of different grant programs, also placing a priority in some of those waters. But we really endeavored from the start to try to be as objective um, and, you know, I guess perhaps scientific um, in, our, in our onset of it to, to limit us down first. Um, so the rest of the slides that I'm going to present right now are really just an overview of what that process was. So you could do next slide for me, Nicole. Okay. All right. So you're looking at a map, and right now it doesn't show much, right? But this is the uh, this is a screenshot of our Michigan Shared Priority Waters web tool. This is a GIS-based platform that allowed us to enter data layers or information we felt might be useful to help identify and prioritize different cold waters. We're hoping to make some final tweaks to this tool to increase its utility to all of you as chapter conservation planning tools and to leave it available for chapter use. So this is something that any of you will be able to click on. And there's different data layers here that would help you say from your chapter perspective, see all of the stream networks in your area, see which ones are predicted cold, cold transitional, cool, warm, um, and see other information about each one of those. So that um, we use this, we only use certain types of information, <clears throat> but we're hoping to leave you with some good basic information where you might use this to sit down as a chapter and say, well, hey, let's take a look at all of the waters in our area and maybe come up with some new places that we should look at, some new areas that we you know, just never knew about. Um, so that'll be coming. I think we're just uh, trying to make a, a last tweak or two and we'll do some additional follow-up when that's available um, just to make sure that everybody knows how to use it and to um, see if you need assistance doing so. Next slide, please. So, <laughs> In some sense, this is now a map of all the uh, sub watersheds in Michigan. And it's pretty daunting. Um, we started the process with maps such as this one showing all primary and secondary watersheds in Michigan. From here, we needed some concepts to identify and rank watersheds based on what types and how much cold waters each provide. Next slide. Okay, this is a pretty busy, this is a pretty busy map. Um, enjoy it for a minute, take it in. Um, all streams in Michigan have been modeled, measured, or predicted to have certain summer water temperature conditions and certain base flow volumes. The figure here illustrates the classes of streams based on size and temperature. Sizes are broken down into streams, small rivers, or large rivers, so three sizes. And temperatures are broken into four classes, cold, cold transitional, which are still cold enough to provide cold water fish habitat, but they're approaching the edge of that optimal condition. Cool, which might support some cold water fish, but are, are not typically at the high densities of cold water fish. So you might find some good brown trout fishing here, or in some cases, they might be good um, Chinook salmon streams where the Chinook salmon don't really have to live there for the summertime. So cool waters aren't necessarily waters that we're not interested in, but they're not optimal. And then the last class is warm. And, um, you know, roughly this goes from blue is the coldest, green is the next, 
pink is the the cool or the um, transitional uh, cool transitional um, and then red is the warm and you'll just see that um, to no surprise you kind of see the cluster in the northern lower peninsula of of nice cold streams you see a little bit down in southwest michigan and then you see kind of a smattering around the up um, the, we decided to use this kind of information as the basis for this project the temperatures along with the groundwater yield predictions or base flows involved with it make this both relevant to the quality and abundance of cold water fish present today but it's also reflective of the resilience to future warming. Next slide. So I'll spend a little time here. I, I won't um, beat everybody to death with it, but a little introduction to some of these different river types. Uh, the first is the cold transitional large river. And <clears throat> going from the large, I'll tell you that in Michigan, <clears throat> we don't have any um, of the cold large rivers, at least anymore. Uh, maybe in the past, and maybe if we didn't have some of the gigantic uh, dams on some of our lower sections of rivers, maybe we would have some. But in most cases, the, our large rivers, the coldest category now is cold transitional large river. Um, <clears throat> these are really rare. In order to have a river of this size that is still cold, it represents uh, what it represents is a cold, high quality watershed upstream feeding cold water downstream and healthy groundwater supplies. These are the rarest temp size class in Michigan with only four watersheds containing them. The Manistee, the Asable, the Pierre Marquette, and the White. The next slide shows the distribution of these in Michigan and you can forward. So as you can see, these cold transitional large rivers are truly rare, both in Michigan and actually in the Midwest. Think of these as uh, very rare, very large spring creeks. These are groundwater dominated systems that are very large. Because of the size and rarity, rarity of these and for what their presence represents for the watersheds feeding them, <clears throat> we ended up putting a priority on these types of watersheds uh, supporting these. Next slide. So next is the cold small river. <clears throat> These are the medium sized stretches, but are still found in the coldest temperature category. Temperatures here are quite cold and robust. These are also relatively rare these days, both in Michigan and the Midwest. And you can forward to the next slide. From this map of the cold small rivers, you can see they are more uh, common than the cold transitional large rivers, but still very limited. The presence of this class of river was also prioritized. Next slide. So we also have cold transitional small rivers. While these are slightly warmer than the last class, cold transitional small rivers still support healthy cold water fisheries. And they again are also quite rare in Michigan and the Midwest. Next slide. <clears throat> this map shows the distribution of these cold transitional small rivers in Michigan. While this class was also prioritized, it was slightly less than the two previous classes. Next slide. So I'm kind of skipping some of the intros now. Um, this shows you a map of the cold stream segments in Michigan, the smaller ones. The term stream applies to all of our smaller flowing waters, often referred to as creeks or small tributaries. Just like the branches and twigs of a tree canopy, the overall mileage of these watersheds is high. This map shows the distribution of the cold streams in Michigan. Notice there is a relatively high abundance of these compared to the larger classes of streams. We also quantified the mileage of this class and factored this into our prioritization scheme. Next slide. This map shows cold transitional streams, small waters where temperatures are still good for cold water fish, but without much ability to buffer warming and still support trout at healthy numbers. 
this this type of water is important um, as components of our cold water cold water portfolio but for the sake of ranking and providing contrast among watersheds we did not use the abundance of this class of water for chapter project planning though this would still be a class of stream you wouldn't want to overlook working on also not shown here are cool waters again those might support some resident trout they might support salmon or support stocked cold water fisheries. These can also be important fisheries. We just didn't consider them in this selection process. Next slide. Okay, <clears throat> this shows the web viewer with the temperature classes that we used for analysis. You can take it in for a second. You can see those, those larger categories, the blue sections, the purple sections, uh, the orange and then the green, and you can kind of see where they're located around the state of Michigan. Next slide. So we also explored some other similar data sets along with the temperature classes. This one depicts groundwater yield. This is a prediction of the amount of groundwater that results into the stream at base flow per acre of the watershed. In this sense, it's about like how much cold stable river flow does each acre of a watershed result into its streams. High groundwater yield systems are colder, more stable, and will be more resilient to future warming trends, thus more likely to be high quality cold water fisheries well into the future. We ultimately didn't end up using this as the information it represents in most cases overlaps with information built into the stream temperature classes and those temperature classes relied upon these uh, in part. Next slide. We also explored the utility and unique information contained in the Great Lakes Conservation Portfolio, a tool developed by TU in conjunction with NIFWIF this similar tool contains information or data layers from a lot of different sources. It does focus on brook trout, but many of the data layers are useful for all cold water fish. While we expect to use this more as we develop refined strategies for the shared priority water selected, <clears throat> we ultimately did not heavily rely on this as again, we can infer many of the basic information considerations included in this from the temp class layers. While not heavily used, these are just some illustrations to show that the committee spent quite some time reviewing, playing with, and discussing the metrics and tools to best use. Okay, next slide. And this is probably where you'll want to lean in and, and start really uh, looking at uh, all the rivers you recognize the names of. So, <clears throat> We then took the map of the streams and their sizes and temp classes, and we calculated the miles of each temperature size classes per watershed, and also the total miles of them. Again, cold transitional streams and cool streams were not included here. This table is the starting list of candidate lower peninsula watersheds. We identified any watersheds that that had any miles of the large or small river categories, then calculated miles of those plus the cold stream mileage. We also considered metrics like land cover types. As you look carefully at this table, you might be surprised by some of the numbers. By far, the Manistee emerged as the largest cold water system, perhaps not surprising given its length or that it includes both the Pine and the Little Manistee River watersheds, which both rank quite high in miles, even if treated individually. The Muskegon has high total miles, but mostly in the form of cold streams and cold transitional small river. The Asaba was very high in miles with a mix of all classes. The White River next in total miles and miles of, of the large river type and mixes of small rivers and streams. The Rapid River and nearby Elk Lake drainages had high total miles, but primarily due, due to the area of it and streams small streams with low small rivers and no large river miles. So functionally, the next was the pure Marquette River. After that, we examined the Jordan, 
which has limited small river miles, but a very high mileage of cold streams. Each of the listed watersheds, we took a deeper dive into what they had, where they had them, and also discussed for all watersheds, chapters, partners, funders, past work, known needs, and our ability to contribute needed unique value. And, uh, next slide, please. So this is the same table of information, but for the upper peninsula waters. A similar approach was taken in the UP, but we did find significant differences than the lower peninsula that warranted us considering through the potential candidates a bit differently. The Lake Superior coastline had an incredible number of cold stream miles with small cold water systems all over it, including lots of small direct trib tributaries to Lake Superior. This is more of a region than a watershed, but it was broken out to note the uniqueness of it. Systems like the Ontonagon, Paint, and Iron Rivers had impressive mileages. Compared with the Lower Peninsula, they provided less of the small river classes, and no large river classes exist, but cold streams are abundant. The Manistique, which includes the Fox, plus many nearby stream systems, shows the largest amount of the small river class miles, mileages. Given some of the enhanced difficulty of separating these UP watersheds, we did end up consulting with UP chapters to help in differentiating and prioritizing among the UP potential sites. Next slide. So we were eventually able to force some choices in sorting and reduce the list of potential shared priority water sites down to preliminary tier one and tier two sites. However, both of those lists still constituted a final list, too encompassing and diluting of efforts to be feasible. So we refined the list down further to the resulting list of proposed sites. Next slide. In the UP, we condensed parts of the Ontonagon, paint, iron, and brule systems into one Western UP wild trout area. The Manistique watershed was selected and contains the Fox, Stutz, Driggs, and a plethora of other streams. We also proposed one focus, not based on a watershed area, but based on coaster brook trout and the large number of cold streams feeding into Lake Superior. At this point, we have not bounded the exact spatial extents of that, but the map representation is just a rough visual. In the lower peninsula, you can see that um, the, the three that ranked the, the highest um, for cold water portfolio were the Osable, Manistee, White, and the Pure Marquette. Next slide. So in the lower peninsula, <clears throat> we proposed four of the top cold water watersheds based on cold water stream class miles and the diversity of types of those classes present. For example, the rare large river classes. Some of these are expansive and daunting. It's possible that having four of this size may be too much, but we also found it hard to limit to less than these. Next slide. <clears throat> so, uh, we are now at the point of proposing candidate waters for inclusion, inclusion into this initial round of TU Shared Priority Waters Program. We would like to solicit questions and feedback now. Once we do, we will reflect on those and propose a slate for discussion and approval by the Michigan TU Board. Once the slate gets approved, we must then get to even more difficult work developing our actual strategies for what and how we will help these waters. Yes, we've begun discussing the general nature of that as part of considering which to propose, but much more detailed work will need to be done in order to develop robust, relevant strategies for us to fit into existing partner communities for these waters and to provide real value to these resources. And we will be developing the framework for how all members of TU can be engaged and contribute to these efforts. Next slide. So a <clears throat> couple of reminders. These are sites being proposed for inclusion in the first round of this initiative. This will likely not be the last round. The period for these aligns with TU's strategic plan, which lives for approximately five years. 
So expect a revisitation of these at least at that interval. These are meant to be places that a wide swath of TU members and partners can rally behind and collaborate. This is not a list of places where we will only do our work. Our mission is to work for all cold waters, whether restoring the degraded, protecting the great, and making the good great. We expect and need chapters to continue taking care of its special places, and we will continue doing the most good in the most places possible, adaptively trying to provide the greatest added value wherever that might be. This is meant to add to and enhance our work. It doesn't replace all of it. Next slide. So at this point, I'd like to just see if, um, if any of the other work group members have anything that they would like to share about the process and what we've proposed. Yeah, Brian, thanks, this is Greg. Um, you know, I think as we went through this over the course of the late winter and the spring, it really became apparent how um, rich we are here in Michigan with, with cold and cool water resources. Um, and, you know, as, as Brian and Nicole both stressed, none of these uh, choices were made rashly or through favoritism or anything like that, but these really represent uh, systems where we feel we can make the most difference over the next five years. Um, but I think, Brian, as you just kind of concluded, it's we're only at the beginning of this process. You know, this was in some ways as hard as this was, this was the easy part. Now we've got to come up with some sustainable strategies to, you know, move some work forward on these waters. But, you know, I think it was it was interesting. It was great to work with Nicole and Jeremy and Jake and Kristen and Brian and, you know, get the benefit of the depth of knowledge and care that they all have <clears throat> for our, our cold water stuff. So it was it was really on my end. It was really it was a great process. And again, we're only at the beginning. So a lot of work to do, but I think we're off to a great start. And I. Uh... Anybody hear me? Hello? Hi. This is Tom, uh, whoever's on the call, except whatever. Uh, I just want to kind of build on what Greg just said. I am the non-science guy in this whole thing. I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm, on the, I'm the, you know, the council chair at the present time, but uh, it, it, I, I'm more of a business guy and somebody who runs meetings and watches people do stuff. And, and I just wanted to, to let everybody out there know and thank all the people around the team uh, for all the work that they did. This was not an easy task. The 35,000 roughly miles of cold water transitional or cool streams in the state of Michigan uh, over a, a state that's, if you added all the miles up, it's probably, it's bigger than the state of Georgia. It's huge. Um, and we're blessed with all of that, that we were able to, the, the team was able to you know, drill down through all that stuff. Jeremy, Kristen, uh, uh, who else did I? Who am I missing? Uh, Brian, uh, I know I'm missing. So Jake, uh, the stuff, the work that they did was uh, unbelievable. My eyes were open largely. I, actually, when I started looking at these maps the first time, I, I kind of looked like somebody, you know, the guy that stuck his finger in a light in a light socket, and the eyes just kind of blew up and said, "Holy crap! Look at all the stuff that we've got." And how do we sort through all of that as an undaunting task? And at the end of the day, the last, the, I think the last couple of, of uh, meetings that we had, uh, I know there's all kinds of, uh, there's, there's, every chapter has um, their, 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 their local waters. This is not gonna go away. You gotta still, people, will, chapters still need to work on those things and get the resources and we'll, everybody will work together to help that. But this kind of sorts out, you know, the bigger ones that we can, Kind of prioritize and and all get behind i think uh and, and to brian's point right we'll take any kind of input from anybody at this point you know say other you know put other things on and this is this is not a static list it's going to be moving over time but the fact is that we we got we have a place to start to uh to tackle what i think is and brian used the words a little while ago daunting it's a bit of a daunting task 
But uh, at the end of the day, though, the one item that came out to me, uh, and, and if you're thinking about wild and, and wild trout and is, is something that we all ought to look for, and we have lots of wild and we have naturalized trout. But when he came up with this, how do you how do you address the upper part of the UP, the that whole North Shore of uh, of Michigan along Lake Superior, and the I don't know how many miles of those little thirty five hundred miles of streams or whatever were up there. And if we could find a way to start identifying where the coasters are, how they behave, and bring that whole part over the next decade or two back to life, that'd be something. I just, it's just, it'd be like a legacy. So yeah, for the, for, for this, this process, but uh, I want to thank everybody for doing what they did. I hope I chimed in when at times were right to say something profound or something funny to make people laugh. But uh, uh, this is, a, I think it's a really good process. And, 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 and as I learned about when this were a couple of years ago, about a year ago, when TU National is going down this path and said, you know, we all do a lot of work around the country, different streams, different rivers, and we know we're doing good stuff, but this gives us a reason to say, why are we doing it? And uh, I think it's a good roadmap to the future. Enough of me. Brian, Greg. Thank you, Tom. Um, I see Kristen and Jeremy. Uh, Kristen, first, do you have anything that you'd like to add or no? I don't think I have much to add. Um, just, I think kind of echoing what everyone else has said, it's, it was a, I think we went through a really great process to kind of evaluate our water in Michigan. And um, I think it was enlightening for those of us who are the scientists also to kind of look at it in um, different ways than we sometimes do um, in terms of sort of miles and, and um, things like that. So um, I think it was, I think we, we're able to have a really um, thoughtful and kind of thorough look through things to try to figure out the best um, places to have these shared priority waters. So um, I thought it was a really great process. And I think we came up with some, some pretty good ideas at the end. Thank you, Kristen. How about Jeremy? You're muted. Can you hear me? Yes, we can now. Just getting back from my kid's soccer practice. I'm a little disheveled right now. Um, but yeah, I have nothing to add. I think great summary, Brian and Nicole. Great presentation. I think you summed it up great. And just, you know, I'll echo everybody else's. It was a it was a challenging task. Um, but we had a lot of thoughtful conversations and I think a very logical approach to get to this point. And um, you know, just to emphasize <laughs> what Brian had said um, and Greg reiterated, and I'll also do that, uh, this is kind of the, the first go at it, go around of this whole process too. Um, and it is an, on a revolving uh, schedule uh, attached to a strategic plan. So it's, this is not by any means set in stone and we'll continue to have um, subsequent iterations in the future. Um, but I think this is a great starting point and um, yeah, and that's about it. Kudos to the committee and for all the, the work that everybody has put into this. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, my last comment, and I'll spin it into answering a question I saw from, from Sean. Um, <laughs> if I worry about anything, it's that uh, we did not make enough hard choices. Um, <laughs> uh, I think we, we all approached it knowing that almost every watershed in the state of Michigan is some TU members favorite watershed and, um, that we would be making some upsetting choices by necessity. Um, at the end of the day, um, I think we found it all very difficult to limit it less than this, but I will say that, uh, <laughs> Eight of uh, seven of these areas is a tremendous amount of water to dig into. Um, and I guess we didn't mention this, but because we created this initiative and we're figuring it out together, um, I want to make sure everybody doesn't have any misconceptions. 
there is no like hundred million dollar grant from a benefactor that will immediately be given us to given to us to implement anything. Um, this is just a tremendous amount of hard work to really dig in and find all of the work on these waters that needs to be done, prioritize that, go out, work hard to find every dollar that we need, and then work equally hard to implement everything. And the second we get through that, you know, repeat and then repeat again and repeat again. Um, so if anything, um, the choices were hard, and I'm not sure at the end of the day whether we made uh, quite enough hard choices. Um, that we chose a lot of water, um, but you know, uh, everybody's reach should maybe be a little further than their grasp. So um, we're going to try for it. So with that, um, let's see if there's any other questions. Sean, you had mentioned, you had chatted one in about how long the process took. Um, the process took us probably about seven or eight months so far just to kind of figure out which ones we wanted to propose. Um, hopefully at the council meeting coming up on July 16th, we'll have another discussion about it. And uh, as soon as these, you know, final slate is approved, then we have to begin, you know, the probably the harder work of figuring out exactly what and where within each one of these watersheds um, and how we do the work and then get to work writing grant proposals and trying to find the money and the volunteers, the members, the chapters to participate. So, um, you know, this was maybe a six or eight month process just to propose them. And then we have the much harder work, the more serious work ahead of us. Great, thanks for answering that. Um, will this slide deck be available for folks on the, on the email? Yeah, what we'll do um, tomorrow or by Friday is we'll try to find the right venue to get um, either the slide deck or a PDF or in case, my, my hunch is if we send um, a PDF of this size to more than 50 recipients, it's gonna get triggered as spam and get sent back. So we'll try to find a place to post it and we'll post a recording of this um, up online and send the notice out with a link to everybody so they can view it. I'm thinking maybe if we just put it on their Michigan TU website, maybe, or TU National, I, one of the two of them will be a good kind of good place to put it. Yep. We'll figure, we'll figure out the most convenient um, IT friendly way to get this out into everybody's hands and accessible. And we'll, Brian, we'll would, there be, would there be any pushback showing this within the Kind of more the, the the local chapter kind of you know Facebook page or anything of that end. Would there be any pushback doing that? Nope, nope, um, absolutely not. Share around, um, and uh, you know I think at this point the only caveat is you know the the Michigan TU board has not really given its blessing or approved it. Uh, this is really a proposal from our work group, but. That is the only sure. caveat on sharing, and we, we would invite that and thank you for doing so. Well, it sounds like there's still some work to do or some approvals before it sounds like this should probably be shared at this point. That's what I'm gathering. Well, I think, I think at this point it would be absolutely fine to share with other chapter members, chapter board members, because at our... Um, well, the Michigan TU board who, who needs to um, approve or modify or ultimately bless this um, is really made up of two board members from each of the chapters. So it, it would help us tremendously if chapter board members share this around and really discuss it um, so that we can get all the feedback that we really need and be able to eventually um, you know, move forward to the next phase. So no, don't hold back. Um, eventually, if you know, if a final slate does get approved, um, we will plan a, a, a more comprehensive rollout of it with um, not just kind of chapters and board members, but with all TU members as well. Mm -hmm. Good. Okay. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, I would just reiterate, Sean, uh, the more this gets distributed to chapter members, you know, and, and, and if chapter members have comments, questions, 
you know, good, bad, or ugly, if they pass them on to their reps, hopefully those those chapter representatives will be at the at the July meeting and and we have a fuller response from the council. I mean, we want to hear from everybody. We don't want to hear from 10 people that this is great or this sucks. We want to hear a lot of voices because, you know, we've we made some hard choices and, and some people are going to question them as well they should. Um, we need that. We don't just want to rubber stamp it and, and move on and feel good about it. So if there's hard questions and, and discussions, we want to have those. Appreciate it. Thanks. Absolutely. And I see that, uh, let's see, Greg Prozen uh, wrote, no big surprises on the choices of waters prioritized and good to see coastal brook trout, brookie water included on tonight's call. However, all I see is mostly only the working committee preaching to the choir. The word really needs to be promulgated to our grassroots and potential partners to bring all aboard. Good work. Yes, thank you, Greg. Right, Greg. Uh, absolutely, thank you. Thank you. Other questions? There's gotta be. Who knew? Brian, this is John Highland. Hey, not a question, just a comment. You know, the, the fact that uh, that we do have, you know, readily seven, you know, good sized watersheds, good sized areas that kind of floated to the top, if you will. I mean, to me, that's a good thing. So that really shows again somebody mentioned earlier i think you might have mentioned earlier you know the, the blessing we have of the amount of, of good water we have in the state and to me that you know that kind of reiterates that that we've got a lot of good water the fact we had so many you know difficult choices and i don't really see this at least for our chapter particularly this isn't going to be limiting at all because all four of the areas that are chosen in they're all all three of the areas sorry that are chosen in the up all involve our chapter in a big way. There's a lot of water in our area that you know, shows up on this list. So it's not gonna be at all limiting, at least for us. Great, thank you. John, the fact that you have half the UP may be a little bit bigger than half the UP probably explains that. Well, yeah, that, that, that's <laughs> true, but that's all right. And, and you can't stop working on places like the Eskima, Upper Eskimob either. Nope, nope, nope. There's, yeah, the, the way I look at it, you know, we, we've had the discussion within the chapter before. There, there is no lack of, of things that need to be done up here, no lack of opportunities, you know, across the UP, just like, you know, the northern part of the lower as well, uh, which in itself, like I said, is a good thing. If we didn't have very much that we needed to do, that would, to me, that would be a bad thing. That would mean it pretty much we either don't have any water or it's too late, one of the two. So, you know, the fact that we've got a lot of opportunities, I think, is a good thing. And yeah, I, I see there's gonna be a lot of things that we can rally around. Thank you. Thank you, great comments. Great comments. Anybody else? Okay. I just, well, I, I, I just wanna close with one thing. I'm gonna, I did this at one of our work group meetings. I'm gonna, paraphrase a guy named Barry Berlin, who's the voiceover for In Fisherman TV. So much water, so little time. It's unbelievable. First time I saw that map that Brian put up, folks, I was, my, my, my eyes were just like, wow, it's unbelievable. Uh, we have opportunities, but we have challenges. And it's going to be interesting seeing how we gain, you know, get the funding to do stuff that we decide that we're that needs to be done on these various streams. But uh, Michigan is blessed, and uh, let's not squander it. Let's make some, let's make it way better than it was when we got here. Sounds good. Good way to end. If any of you do get other comments, um, or if anybody watches this recording after the fact, and you do have um, some questions, uh, desire for discussion, uh, you can reach out to any of us, or if it's easiest, you can reach out to me uh, by email or telephone, and I will do my best to give you a call back or reply over email and um, try to get any questions you may have answered. Um, so please don't hesitate. And I, Thank want to you add, all. I want to add one more thing to that is uh, I want to make sure that at, at some point in the near future that 
we find a way to uh, engage a lot more of our 8,000 members across the state to, to view this, uh, to get engaged. And I would encourage the chap uh, chapters uh, to, to uh, have some of, you know, show this at chapter meetings, have a, you know, a membership thing and, and start talking about it. And uh, uh, the more input that we get, uh, the more people we have engaged, the more stuff is gonna be, you know, float to the top and the more people we have interested and get stuff done. Uh, brought to you by the Michigan Council of Trout and Limited. Well, we, we do appreciate all the work you guys did on this. So uh, it, it'll be fun going forward, I'm sure. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I hope you have a great evening. Thank you for giving us some of your time tonight. Right. Have a Thanks, great night. Everyone. Take Thanks, care, everybody. Good, Good night. night. Brian, you're still on. Yeah. Could you email yes. me? Could you email me the the slide?